All right, looks like I'm live and we're ready to start talking about some RPGs and theft. See, I knew there were gonna be fans of theft in this audience. So uh, what are we talking about today? We're talking about role-playing games, the tabletop variety, not just the video game type, but specifically the wide and wondrous world of interesting mechanics and styles and books. And there are a lot of them. Uh, that's part of why I did this talk. There's just so much to wade through and so much to steal <laughs> and put in our video games. I've heard it kind of has occasionally worked, so let's get into it. Uh, who am I? So for those who don't know, uh, my name's Evan Hill. I've been a level designer for about 10 years. I'm currently at Obsidian making Outer Worlds 2. I also used to be a part of Naughty Dog making The Last of Us Part 2. Also somewhat relevant, I've made Torment Tides of Numenera, Solar Ash, worked on a game called Palea, and very specifically, uh, this one, uh, inspired by, or follow up by Planescape Torment, um, is really relevant to this talk because it's one of the few major games to adapt Monty Cook's cipher system. It's very different than D&D. It's rather complicated. We don't have time to get into it now. Got a lot of slides to get through, so let's just get to the stealing. So here's the plan. I'm gonna walk you guys through each game. We're gonna case the joint. We're gonna study the mechanics, and then we're gonna figure out how to steal it and fence, I mean, put it into our own video games. <laughs> and then we're gonna learn from others. So here are the targets. I've broken this down into six simple st steps, targets, areas. We're gonna talk about characters in time, basically character stats, interesting things like that. Weird resolutions, which is bonkers ways that you can play games instead of rolling dice. Uh, short and sweet, one page RPGs in the absolute territory of strange, interesting things that come out of there. Ancient knowledge, where we're gonna start talking about people reviving the more Gygaxian days of tabletop RPGs. And uh, I'm not going to explain Disco Mist Apocalypse yet. You can get there when we get there. First, let's do characters in time. How could I start a talk about stealing without first talking about Blades in the Dark by John Harper? There's a reason for the hoots. This game is phenomenal. And one of the first things we're gonna dive into is, other than it's just basically greatness, it's basically a uh, tabletop dishonored, for those who don't know. That's all we really need to jump into the best first mechanic, which is flashbacks. Like any good heist movie, this game allows us to meet an obstacle, and instead of actively trying to solve it in the moment, we can jump backwards in time and say, fix it before we even got there. Say you see a guard around a corner. In Blades in the Dark, instead of stealthing behind him or trying to take him out non-lethally, you can say, I jumped back to a week ago where I threatened his life with a gun or bribed him. And then we actively make that roll to see whether or not you succeeded. Already we can see the opportunities this provides. And a lot of games have started to do this rather successfully where we take an obstacle and instead of just letting the player figure it out with their tools at hand, we get this rich, cornucopia of options. We can do a lot more social gameplay. We can interject and incorporate skills that aren't necessarily your stunning, your stealthing, or uh, immediate on-hand gear into the gameplay loop. And I mean, I think there's a lot of opportunities. We've got a lot to cover, but uh, say like with Assassin's Creed, the RPGification of that series is going further and further, and can you imagine if like we go back to being Ezio and I can bribe a guard just as easily as I can stab him in the neck? I kinda wanna play that game. Uh, but you might be asking, this is a really powerful ability. How does Blades in the Dark balance this idea of time travel? Uh, pretty well, I'd say. It uses a system called stress. So stress in Blades in the Dark is kind of like this expendable resource that also is a measure of your mental health. So anytime you do a flashback, push yourself on a roll, or try to undo something bad happening to you immediately, you can take a stress. It's rather hard to get rid of. As you can see too, there's also a ticker at the end. If you fill up your stress bar, you're gonna take a permanent debuff called a trauma. And what I think makes this so excellent is that it's not just a second health bar. This is something that has real tangible resource value that's not just, oh, can I take mental damage? It's I'm actively pushing myself. I'm actively tangibly taxing my body and character beyond their normal limits. 
What's the consequence of that? I think Darkest Dungeon demonstrates a really good example of this, even though I would say this kind of leans much more into that second health bar territory, where it's you know, your mental health points. But more than that, it's long-term consequences, I think, are just something phenomenal to learn from. As we said, stress focuses on something that's more than a second health bar. But now, I think everybody who did the woo is probably going to love this next one. We're gonna talk about clocks. So the way Blades in the Darks works is really special. Instead of a normal quest log, instead of you know, tracking inventory or hit points, you also track all of the myriad threads and events that are going on with really simple circles and note cards. And quickly, it starts looking like this. So to explain it simply, uh, a progress clock is just what it says. It can represent anything. It can be a measure of the guard's alertness. It can be your vampire investigation. It could be time until the werewolf uprising. It is this flexible, tangible tool, and any time a player does a flashback, spends some stress, or nearly fails something, the GM is given the opportunity to advance one of these various clocks as a response. And it creates this very winding clockwork experience where every little action is pushing and pulling on this wide variety of intricate threads and stories and states that would be nightmarish to write all the rules out for. Like a guard alert system is already complex enough that we have an entire stealth game genre. So this just lets us condense that all down and focus it. So how can we implement something like this? As I kind of buried the lead on, I think this is a really clean example where we can just wholeheartedly yunk this and put it in our quest log system. Like, more quests can behave in this incremental way, and I think we would see huge gains from utilizing this. Uh, Pathologic 2 also kind of has some vibes of this, though it uses a real-world clock, but we'll talk about that in a bit. Now we're gonna move on from Blades in the Dark, because again, we've got a lot to cover. Uh, burning Wheel and Mouse Guard. <laughs> uh, so this is a very beloved uh, RPG series. This is one of my favorites by far. Um, so initially built by Luke Crane as this kind of obscure fantasy-focused uh, role-playing system, it then partnered with uh, David Peterson to make Mouse Guard, which is a distillation and evolution of everything Burning Wheel was. It is this very character-driven, nuanced experience all of your stats incrementally change over time. Your characters have very defined characteristics, identities, and those two, most startlingly of all, change over time. And the way it does this is through beliefs and instincts. So we're gonna just focus on Mouse Guard for a second. In Mouse Guard, you're basically in a medieval society, but you're made of tiny little guys. Look at them. You're part mouse, part human, and as a result, there's this giant tapestry of roles, professions, identities, ideologies, all at play. And you get to role play that as a part of this intricate little society. So how the game defines it, both in Burning Wheel and Mouse Guard, is with beliefs and instincts. A belief is something kind of tangible. It is a concrete understanding of the world that the character has. And it is meant to be a stance. It is not just a wishy-washy like, oh, I believe hope should save the world. It is something like, you're a peasant farmer and you get to write down on your character sheet, I am the true king of this land. It is, uh, for example, uh, in Burning Wheel, this orc here riding this wolf has beliefs like, I must interrogate an elf, a dwarf, and a human to discover if they have minds like my own. Also, fuck the legion, I will forge my own path. And then the little mouse on the side has an interesting little belief of, a guard mouse needs to think with their head and feel with their heart. They can be simple little character threads, but where this then comes back into the mechanical is any time that you operate in accordance with these beliefs, you get rewarded. You're given persona points, you're given resources to further drive the story and push on a future role. And now an instinct is like a baby version of it. They are the automatic behaviors your character is expected to do, and these are really interesting because they are things that the GM is allowed to say that you do without you saying you do it. So an example of a good instinct is like, I always draw my sword at the sign of trouble. That's great. You can play it where you might get the equivalent of initiative roll anytime something pops out at you. 
It's less great in a courthouse. <laughs> and now all of a sudden you're being presented with these very character-driven trade-offs that can be often helpful, sometimes harmful. But even more interestingly, none of these are meant to be static. The player and the character kind of weave over time. You're able to level up and alter these things. If, say, your belief is, I will always guard the prince and the prince dies, what happens now? And again, this tangible reward is always there. Going back to the instincts, anytime that an instinct negatively affects you, the game design is explicit in that the player then gets that same resource if they opt into it. You can decide to not draw your sword in the courthouse, but that extra XP is really good. So it drives the story forward. And some of you might have noticed that uh, this is very similar to the cop types and thought cabinets in Disco Elysium because uh, these people are very smart and they stole very good things. <laughs> but I want you to think further on though. Like if we started implementing that in our RPGs closer to Mass Effect, we could demonstrate interesting character arcs like Commander Shepard's trust in Earth authority or where they sit on the various relations between the different species. It would be one thing to decide whether the Rachni Queen lives or dies. It'd be another knowing that your bonuses matter towards it. Blowing it up versus sacrificing maybe like a half level worth of experience to change your beliefs now or otherwise adjust against it. Um, like I said, I'm not you. You can take this and run with it however you want. But the one, this is the reason I made the talk though. This next set, vice and nature stats. So in Burning Wheel and Mouse Guard, there are these unique categories of skills. They are not basket weaving, they are not sword fighting, they are these emotional aspects of your character. And they have massive trade-offs. So to start with, in Burning Wheel, I think they're still a bit rough, but still very interesting to talk about. The examples in Burning Wheel are greed, grief, and anger. They work just like your other stats. If you use them on a roll, you take your number and you roll that many dice. Or you can combine them if like sword fighting and athletics. They're usually very good. They give you the option to substitute on any roll a relatively high number. The catch is you need to demonstrably show that it aligns with the vice. So let's take an example. If you have a four in greed and there is an object that you want to bargain for, instead of using your charisma check, you can decide to use your greed stat and potentially get four times of an effective chance of getting it. The negative though is like other stats in Burning Wheel, the more you use it, the more it levels up. And the more a vice stat levels up, the further your character is restricted from certain actions. Uh, greed is another really good example. I believe if you get past a rank three in it, anytime you are divvying things up, even something as simple as a pie, you are not allowed to divvy it up evenly and fairly with other people. You always, always have to take an edge. You always, always have to behave in a certain way. And right there, the player is given this arc, this option that's more than just what's my build, but balancing short-term gains and long-term character-driven consequences. And now, there's a lot to like, unpack there. I don't know if we have full time for it, but modeling with these like, negative traits can be a bit dangerous. And that's why I think uh, Mouse Guard's approach is even a step better. Like This is the truly refined version of it, and it's dead simple. Like If you pause this, you'll be able to read this really quickly. The way Mouse Guard works is because you're just a cute little guy, if you do things that a tiny little mouse thing would do, you can substitute your nature stat. Basically anything that's like climbing, escaping, hiding, foraging, you just get natural ability at doing that thing. Now, where it gets interesting is you can also use it to act against your nature, standing up and fighting, guarding, running through fire, anything that's against your nature, you can then substitute this stat that ranges usually from one to seven in a game where seven is like, level 15, to do anything. But anytime you act against your nature, it taxes it. Meaning the next time you use it for any reason, it's one less rank. If you deplete it, you're going to 
lose an entire pip in it until you recover, possibly taking multiple sessions. So you're presenting the player with this like easy road of good bonuses moving towards an alignment or a style or a class that you see as valuable and helpful. But they're not limited to that. They are constantly given this choice to nitro boost their roles to try and succeed. But with that balancing consequence of the cost later, the character impact. If you deplete your nature all the way, your character gets described as either obsessive or odd. If you let your nature get too high, your character kind of settles and doesn't want to go out and adventure anymore. And they get negatives on both ends of the spectrum. And the game itself then suddenly demonstrates that it has this tension between these two different essences that the character has, both as a mouse and as a warrior or a craftsman or uh, you know, somebody who will go out and fight an owl face to face. But yeah, it, it, what I really love about this, and again, the whole reason I built this talk was because what we're seeing is something that is a resource and a stat all at once. You are able to spend this, stockpile it, utilize it however you want to shape the story, and how you use it naturally creates a dynamic character. Even with this just singular access, you're showing a character's ups and downs, confronting with not only how they perceive the world or act in it, but their own internal landscape gets shifted one way or another depending on how this action goes out. And I can't think of a game where this wouldn't be interesting. And yeah, that's what we're here to do, is just, I think there's a ton of these tools that can just be put nearly anywhere. But let's just keep going into the simple, easy to steal stuff. One of my favorite rules in Burning Wheel, which is a game that's normally very complex, is just roll versus bloody. It's dead simple. Two people fight, they just roll die and see who gets the bigger number and they get the damage. No checking against AC, no maneuvering. It's meant to be just like, oh, we can do a bar brawl. Uh, we're about the same strength, what happens? Some of you might notice that uh, another favorite cop of ours also uses this mechanic because again, these people are very smart and I like them. But now we're on to part two. Weird resolutions. So who here has played Jenga? So the games we're about to talk about are wonderful bits of design on completely opposite ends of the spectrum. In Dread, it is a survival horror game where every time you take a risky action, you need to take a block out of the Jenga tower. And if the Jenga tower falls over, everyone dies. <laughs> and then in Starcrossed, you're playing a romantic scene between two star-crossed lovers. And every time you take an action, you take a block out of the Jenga tower. And when it falls over, you have to make out now. <laughs> that is the complete breaking point of the tension. And yeah, so the whole Jenga of it all already, we're seeing that like when we talk about RPGs, when we talk about storytelling games, we don't need to be limited to just die and paper. We can produce the same kind of emergent behavior and engaging stuff with radically different tools. And well, I think this is like a fun example, I think there is even more unexplored territory here. So some of you might already be thinking, how do I put this in a video game? Oh, do I just model the physics of a Jenga tower? You might then realize that that's not necessarily the most compelling thing. It's also still just randomness and variety. But I think we're also missing another aspect of it. If I have something like this, and I'm in a scene where there is a cataclysmic or critical event that happens when I knock it over, you're constantly giving your player the option to just flip the table over. <laughs> if you're playing this in a negotiating game, instead of it being necessarily like, oh, when the Jenga tower falls, I fail, it's I can decide to knock this over, walk out of here, maybe with my dignity intact, and certainly a lot of negative reputation, but some other way. Uh, this is also basically what happens in stealth games. So for my work in Last of Us and my love of Metal Gear, like one of the best ways to describe failing stealth is knocking the Jenga tower over. Sometimes you're going to deliberately try to pick it apart, move through paths, naturally just accidentally tip it over and things get loud. And other days, you're just gonna bust the door open with a shotgun and start screaming. And both of these are these valid, interesting, narratively relevant ways of approaching something. So I think there's something there. But moving on still, uh, roll and write. This one might be slightly unfamiliar to some people. It's a new kind of emerging genre. It's getting quite popular where it's almost a solo game. 
You sit down with some friends, you roll some dice, you allocate those numbers onto a table, and you do things like build railroads or condominiums. If you're thinking it sounds like Yahtzee, it essentially is, but there is this massive diversity of genre and style and mechanics, and some people are already starting to use it. Uh, many of you have probably heard of Citizen Sleeper, and basically that's all this game is. At the beginning of the day, you're given a pool of dice of varying values, and the game and the story evolve depending on where you allocate them. Like, this was one of the most compelling games of last year, and it's essentially cyberpunk Yahtzee. And it doesn't end there. Um, there's this uh, survival space sim called uh, Tharsis, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, that, again, uses this same really simple mechanic to tell deep, complicated stories about survival and resource allocation and just the risk of attempting risky maneuvers in the vacuum of space. And this doesn't have to stay to, like, in the survival main. Like, Dicey Dungeons came out like four years ago. I wanna see more combat, more interaction mechanics that have the kind of pop and depth as this game. And I think it's not a hard sell. Again, some people are very smart. <laughs> uh, but let's keep moving. So we also have one-page RPGs. So often people think RPGs are these massive tomes that just require a master's degree to even approach, much less fully comprehend. No. Sometimes you just have a game like Honey Heist where you are a bunch of bear criminals with two stats, bear and criminal. And you can play this in an afternoon and just have a wonderful time with your friends. Or Sexy Battle Wizards, which just has sexy battle and wizard as stats. Or John is everyone, where three of you get to play as John. And the voice is inside of his head. They're simple and cool, and I'm going to leave it at that because they're simple and cool. Uh, and now we're gonna get into something a bit interesting. The OSR. For people who don't know, there is this uh, trend among Dungeons & Dragons aficionados of the old school revival. It's kind of an attempt to return to the traditional ways of like AD&D. There are some caveats. A lot of these people sometimes uh, maybe go for the aesthetic of the 1980s a little too hard and end up being uh, coming off a little crusty. But I think the core of this thing is still very good and wholesome and really uh, demonstrate some of the things that we're lacking in a lot of modern game design. Uh, focuses on player agency. They tend to be rules light. One of my favorite systems in it is just about 10 pages as a pamphlet. It's usually highly lethality and low power. So, you know, everybody's played a level one campaign or at least seen people try to stream it and die very quickly on it. And it's usually very focused on resource management. Uh, credit to uh, Paolo, yeah. credit to Lines for uh, writing the article I got all that from, but uh, some of the most standout people in this are uh, Ben Milton. Uh, he's the one who wrote that small 10-page pamphlet I just mentioned called Nave, which you can just pick up and play. It is really approachable, really easy to play, and hits all the things that we're talking about. Even more importantly, he wrote one of my favorite dungeons of all time called The Waking of Willoughby Halls, where you are stuck in a haunted mansion where another adventuring party runs in with a stolen goose from an angry giant. So you're dealing with this just lasagna of problems that turns into the tabletop equivalent of a hitman level on acid. Can't sell that better than I just did. He also has an even shorter, even more condensed version called Maze Rats. This is just a couple pages. There are no classes, and even when it comes to spell casting, you get one spell a day and you randomly roll it. It is just meant to be raw, immediate, quick, fun, that captures all of the beauty and all of the just intricacy of improv with your friends. Um, another major standout that is always worth looking at is Chris McDonald's Into the Odd. So its follow-up is even more <laughs> stunning, and this is the one we're going to focus on here. It's called Electric Bastion Land. As a setting, as a piece of art, check it out for just that. There is an entire racial category for Muppets. I did not stutter. But one of the most interesting things of this and Nave is you can make a character in this game in less than five minutes. You just have three stats, you roll them, and then you figure out what failed career your character is. There is no quibbling over what color belt buckle do I need. 
but there is a random table for it if you really want to dig that far. And you can be everything from a science mystic, a prize breeder, a machine whisperer, there's a hundred plus of these things. And you are just meant to be thrown into this wild, strange world, and all of these mechanics facilitate that. They facilitate you jumping into this setting with no need to be on-ramped, no need to, again, sit down and do three hours of studying or a session zero, you're just able to go. And your characters will probably not be around long enough anyway, so you'll just roll up another one again. Uh, a lot of you might be realizing that this is fairly similar to a lot of other game designs that we're used to today, and that makes sense. This is the core of what seeded things like Rogue, not just Rogue likes, but the original Rogue. Things like System Shocks, uh, Hitman, anything with emergent sims or roguelike design really finds its roots in these things. And even still, we're finding more to look back on and kind of harvest from this era of game design. There's just so much to be said about simplifying, about removing complexity and letting you just kind of get to the meat of the story, of the narrative, by getting out of the player's way and just letting them roll some numbers. And now for the, my favorite part of this talk. The Disco Misc Apocalypse. This is the big score. This is the thing that during my research I kind of came across and absolutely fell in love with. Uh, there's this system called Apocalypse World. It's brilliant. It kind of came out and was a bit obscure, but since then it's been continually licensed. There are multiple games that utilize this. Uh, Dungeon World, Monster Hearts, and I think most poignantly and the, the best example is City of Mist. So, what makes this thing special? Unlike all of these other settings, unlike all of these other um, systems, this is built story logic first. It's not coming from the ground up and trying to establish uh, complex systems. It is, I want to take a story action, what's the result? And one of the benefits of this is it lets you have really simple characters, just like with the OSR. Here we have somebody who's based off Little Red Riding Hood. Her abilities are not complicated rules text. They are literally bulletproof red hood, arsenal of hunting weapons, high school rumors. Those are the things she's good at. If you can justify her using any of those things, you get a bonus to your role. If you mess up on that role, you're going to take some consequences or partially accomplish your goal. Uh, we're running out of time a little bit, so I'm just gonna kinda speed through this, but overall, this system is wonderful. You need to check it out. We, it's flexible, it's able to render tons of characters of any variety and style, and really all you need is what you see on this table. Dice, you don't even need these note cards. But the real reason I found this so compelling was very quickly I realized is this is what Disco Elysium utilizes. Not just, oh hey, we're rolling 2d6, or oh hey, we're using tags, but this very fundamental approach of story logic first, systems, not even tertiary. You're being presented with a, a game that focused on articulating the attributes of its character and seeing what happened. Failure being one of the most interesting parts about that equation. There's such things as near misses and interesting, funny fuck ups in this game. And I really think it holds itself uh, a lot of credit to the apocalypse system, whether or not this was conscious or unconscious, it wound up kind of blossoming out, and it's what separates it from other games of its era, I think. And also why it's very difficult to just look at Disco Elysium, copy its stats, copy its systems, and attempt to get the same results, because it's just so fundamentally about this top-down approach. That's why the Tribunal is so effective. There is no combat system in this game because it never needed one. It has a system for resolving story conflict and it just presents any fight like a story conflict. And yeah, no, this, this talk might have kind of always secretly been a little bit of a love letter to Disco Elysium, and I'm unabashedly okay with that because they're very good. But uh, we're running out of time, so we're gonna skip or through some of this bonus stuff that I was hopefully gonna cram into the end, uh, but you need to check these out. Pathologic 2, this is off the table. This is not a tabletop game, it's very good. You all need to use this quest system that they have. It is a mind map. It is not a quest log. It is not just a list of things you can do. It is wonderful and great, and I don't have time to gush about it now, but absolute credit to its designer. Uh, she's an absolute genius. Also, Nosha. This is an odd one. This is a single-player visual novel, Among Us-like. 
where you are deciding and figuring out who to cold sleep because some of you are aliens. It also has a porpoise and a pressure chute. You need to play this game. But anyway, if you take anyway, anything away from this talk, it's learn and steal from the best. Don't feel ashamed of this. Game design, just like any other discipline, is something that is collaborative and evolving, and we stand on the shoulders of giants. And that's all we can really hope for. Even if a heist like this, like this talk that I gave, may have been a little less Mission Impossible and a little more Fish Called Wanda, thank you for listening. Uh, you can also all follow me on Twitter, please rate the talk, and then hopefully I'll also have a little bit more to share of this little thing that's not a video game that will be coming soon. <laughs> but yeah, everyone have a wonderful GDC. I hope to uh, see most of you all soon. <laughs>